Thank you so much for joining us for worship and word today at Three Trees Church Online. As your family is gathering in for this time, I want to encourage you to share this content on your social media pages so that your extended friends and family can be blessed by this powerful message. I also want to encourage you to stay connected with us at threetrees.com and on our social media pages. One other thing I want to remind you of, you are in the right place at the right time. Luke chapter 19, verse number 10 it says this, for the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Can we just read that out loud together? Even if you're at home, come on, read this out loud with me. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. This is Jesus speaking. He is telling us what his mission is. He's making it clear that he came to the earth to seek and to save that which was lost so that it could testify of being found. Now, I want you to look with me at Matthew chapter 28. And as you do so, uh, you can draw your attention to verse number 18. Uh, Jesus has actually got 11 of his remaining disciples with him. Uh, he's getting ready to ascend to the right hand of the Father. His earthly ministry is being finished. And, and he, he calls these disciples and he says this. Verse number 18, Jesus came and he spake and he said, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And now I want you to go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Spirit, teaching them to observe these things whatsoever I have commanded you. Um, so what we've seen in the first text is that Jesus himself set the example that his mission on earth was to seek the lost. And then Jesus has clearly made the statement to his disciples that if we are to have a mission, it is that we are to make disciples. Seek the lost, make disciples. But I want you to see one more passage of text, Matthew chapter 25 and as we look at Matthew chapter 25, uh, Jesus is in a discourse with, uh, it's basically giving you a picture of what the, the end of time, standing at the throne of God will look like. And Jesus is having a dialogue with people about whether or not they have fed the hungry and clothed the naked and given uh, shelter to the stranger and visited the prisons, etc. And, and what Jesus says to them in verse number 40, as they're asking, when did we do any of these things, Jesus? Because we didn't see you in that moment when we were making it happen. And Jesus says, verse number 40, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you have done it unto the least of these, you have done it unto me. And as much as you have done it unto the least of these, you have done it unto me. So Jesus even gives us a way that we can not only minister to others, but that we can minister to him here on earth. Not just for him, but to him. Quite a profound thought that I'm going to dive overly into, but we've seen this. Seek the lost, make disciples, and meet needs. Seek the lost, make disciples, and meet needs. Seek the lost, make disciples, and meet needs. Can I get an amen from somebody somewhere? Seek the lost, make disciples, and meet needs. Um, Father, I ask you today to give me an unction that only you can give. I ask you for a special grace. I ask you, God, to help me in this moment to be able to relay what it is that, God, I believe that you would have your people to know, and even more specifically, what you would have our church, God, to know for such a time as this. And just, Lord, let it be done in the name of Jesus. And this church said, amen. amen. You know, uh, it's not hard to notice that there's increasing division in the land. Uh, that's uh, something that I think the enemy likes to do. You know, the Bible uh, has clearly made it prevalent that the, the Satan himself is the father of lies. He is also the author of confusion. I want you to think about those two things for just a minute. The enemy is the father of lies, and he is the author of confusion. What the enemy does is he authors confusion by releasing lies. The Bible even talks about the fact that the enemy is the accuser of the brethren. And he not only accuses us before God, but I believe that he accuses us to one another. And the reason that the enemy likes to tell lies and cause confusion and even lead us into scenarios where that we accuse one another is because it brings division. And if you were to make division as simple as possible, it is this, two visions. And anywhere that a house is divided, it cannot stand. Uh, Kentucky itself has made the statement for many years, united we stand, divided we fall. And the, the same is true 
of the church. Because here's what we see in the book of Acts in chapter 2. Uh, we see that there are 100, about 120 believers and they are together in an upper room and they are awaiting this moment where they're going to receive a gift from heaven to go out into the earth and do what it is that Jesus is commissioning them to do, which I believe was to seek the lost, make disciples, and meet needs. You actually see the book of Acts unfolding in that way. That's exactly what they start doing. They seek the lost, they make disciples, and they meet needs. They do it so prolifically that the first message that is ever preached results in 3,000 lost people being found. That then you see them breaking out house to house and they start making disciples that are so potent in their faith that they are also going forth and not only winning other people to the point that the church is being added unto and even multiplied unto daily, but prisons couldn't stop them. Matter of fact, you could say it this way, that the Roman Empire learned that lions couldn't eat it, fire couldn't burn it, and water couldn't drown it. That's the disciples that were being made in that moment. And then their meeting needs to the point that even as you read Acts chapter 2, they are selling everything that they have and distributing it so that there would be no needs among the people. Think about it. Meeting Needs. It is a picture of what Jesus relayed to his disciples and in his disciples lived out in the book of Acts. And in the midst of so much division and so much confusion about what a vision for such a time as this should be and what it shouldn't be. As I've tried to seek the Lord and I've tried to lay at the altar of God and hear what he would have to say for our church. The thing that's just clear to me is get back to the basics. Just keep it simple. Like, out of all the things that we could argue about and all the things that we could try to say it should be this way and it should be that way, can we all agree that we should seek the lost? Well, that was an overwhelming consensus of agreement. Motion carries. It is passed. Would, would we all agree that we need to make disciples? Come on, don't quit on me yet. Would we all agree that we should make disciples? And would we all agree that we should meet needs? Then can we get behind that vision and go into enemy hell territory and plunder hell so that heaven can be populated? And so that's what, as a church, we're, we're, we are going to, in these coming days, coming weeks, coming months, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that's going to be our focus. We're going to be super intentional about seeking the lost. And as we think about how we're going to seek the lost, there's some things we're going to be able to unveil to you that we'll try to be revelatory and creative about as we take these practical things and make them come to pass. But really, Christianity is a grassroots movement. And maybe one of the things that is, I believe, possibly frustrating to the Lord is that when it comes to seeking the lost, there seems to be this ideology that the only way that somebody can be saved is if they are in a church building and they are responding to an altar because basically we only trust somebody who can hold a Bible in one hand and a microphone in the other to be able to preach the gospel. But when you begin to become a disciple, what you begin to realize is that preaching the gospel is not reserved for the pulpiteer, but that actually we are always preaching and we should just sometimes use words. In fact, the Bible tells us that if you want to see the house of the Lord filled, that the way that that is to happen is that you are to go into the highways and the hedges and compel the lost, come on somebody, compel the lost to come in that the house of the Lord may be filled. And so what even in that, there is this understanding that we have a mandate from God to live a life that is compelling to the lost. Now, Scripture tells us that he that winneth souls is wise. And in an hour where that there is so much confusion and there's so much division and there's so much disagreement over which philosophy or ideology is correct, it becomes increasingly important that we be wise as we preach the gospel. And as you're preaching the gospel, uh, and you, you got to find some lost people to seek out the lost. I bet you there's a lost person in your neighborhood. I bet you there's a lost person in your workplace. I, I hope that there is a lost person in your circle of friends. But the question is, have you actually engaged with the lost, in trying to seek them out in such a way that you realize 
you deal in the merchandise of eternity when you are engaging with that person? Has there been something about your life that has felt the gravity and the weight of the fact that if that person does not develop a relationship with Jesus Christ, is there something that motivates you on the inside that says anybody that's lost can be found and maybe I just get to be a conduit of seeking that person out and introducing them to the Jesus who can change their life, give them a born again experience, cause old things to pass away and make them a new creature in Christ Jesus. And so sometimes when you're thinking about how you're going to argue and you're thinking about how you're going to debate and you're thinking about how mean and sarcastic you can be, maybe one of the things you need to think about is how is that going to affect the lost person that I'm trying to reach? Is it... Wi- okay. Look over at somebody and just tell them, seek the lost. One of my favorite chapters in the entire Bible is Luke chapter 15. And Luke chapter 15 is famous because it is the parable of lost things. It is a moment where that Jesus Christ is teaching about lost things. And the way that it unfolds is that Jesus is starting to teach. And there's a group of Pharisees and scribes. These were religious people. These were people who were always in the synagogue. They're always going to the temple. So to make that clear, they would go to the synagogue where that they could study the word. Then they would go to the temple where that they could facilitate worship. So these are people who are about the word and they're about worship. And, and yet it's all just something, some kind of formality. Nothing is really happening in their hearts. And so as they're Coming to listen to Jesus teach, they're not really coming to listen so that they can lean into what he has to say or get some kind of good takeaway to apply to their life. They really just want to argue with him. You ever, okay. They just, they just want to argue with him. They just want to debate. They, they just want to get in his comment section and just cause problems. And so what's happening is The Bible says that even as Jesus is teaching, these Pharisees and these scribes, the Bible says they are murmuring and complaining. They are murmuring and complaining. They can't even hear the truth that is being preached because they are murmuring and complaining. The Word of God is having no effect in their life because they are consumed with murmuring and complaining. And so it is in response to being surrounded by a group of people that all they knew to do was murmur and complain that Jesus just really draws a line in the sand. You want to know what they were murmuring and complaining about? The people that was hanging out at his table, the people that was seated with him, the people that he was developing a relationship with, they didn't understand why he was hanging out with people they would perceive to be lost. And so what Jesus says is, let me help you understand some things. And he goes into three stories about lost things. The first story that he tells is that there's a lost sheep. And the way that it works is that there were, if there were a shepherd and he had a flock of, of 99 and he lost one, what would that shepherd go do? He would go and he would find that lost sheep and he would put him on his shoulders and he would bring him back to the flock and then he would call all the people in the neighborhood and he would say, we're going to rejoice because that thing which has been lost has been found. And the ideology there is that there was a sheep that was lost. It got wounded in the field. It got hurt in the field. It got broken in the field. It couldn't get back home. It needed some help. And so the shepherd said, I am coming to get you. And when I come to get you, I am literally going to expend the energy to bring you back to a place of safety and a place of security. It's an example of something being lost in the field. As a result of being broken, being hurt, and being wounded. And the shepherd going to get it. The second story of something being lost is the story of a, of a woman. And the woman, it says, she has ten coins. And she loses one of the coins. It's believed that each one of these coins would have been of significant and great value. And as the coin is lost, it says, what, what woman 
would not be willing to light a candle, take the broom, and begin to sweep the house until she finds the coin. Now, what some commentators believe is that this was actually some form of a dowry. It was some form of that which would belong to a bride. Uh, some form of that which that she would bring to the wedding ceremony as a point of value when the marriage took place. And so for her to lose this, it, it was a big deal. It was something that was to meant to be a part of her marriage. And, and when it got lost, it, it didn't get lost in the field. It, it didn't get lost outside. It got lost in the, in the house. And what it implies in the same way that the first story talks about something that can be lost in the field, this one talks about the fact that you can be associated with the bride, be in the house, and still be lost. And the analogy is, if that's the case, you, you got to light a candle... Well, that's intriguing because the psalmist decreed that the word should be a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And if you ever wondered what's happening when the word of God is being preached, there's a candle that's being lit. But you see, the sweeping of the house, that is, that's not dependent upon me and you. That's where the Holy Spirit comes in with the wind of heaven and begins to move stuff around inside the building. You do realize in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, he came in like a rushing, mighty wind. And so what we pray happens is that as the word of God is preached and as the gospel is declared that if there be anybody that is lost in the house that the word of God begins to light up that situation and the Holy Spirit begins to sweep through and begins to expose the fact that there's something of value that just needs restoration reconciliation the grace of heaven now, now notice this, lost things. There's one thing lost in the field. There's another thing lost in the house. One, one thing couldn't get home. The other thing maybe didn't even know it was lost. I can't get no help on a Sunday morning. I need somebody at church online to give me an amen somewhere. You know, you ever been in the house and didn't know you were lost? Here, here's the thing. Thank God that there's a word that will light it up. Thank God there's a Holy Spirit that will sweep some stuff around so that we can realize our desperate need to be a part of what God is doing with his bride. But there's a third lost thing. And this, this lost thing is a, is a son and, and the, the Bible talks about the fact that there are two sons. So one father has two sons. And one of these sons comes to the father and he says, I want my stuff. He was making an early demand on his inheritance. And so the father, uh, this was allowed in Hebrew custom, gives him his stuff. And he goes out and he starts to spend every single thing that he has. And the Bible says, and then a famine came. Now, that ain't, ain't that how the devil plays you? He just makes you think it's always going to be there and there's always going to be more than enough. And that even if you lose what you got, you can get it back. And then the famine came. And if you read Luke 15, especially in the Amplified version of the Bible, I've been reading it quite a bit lately. It just kind of amplifies what the original text may have meant. It talks about the fact very explicitly that he reached the point where nobody would give him anything. Now that'll preach. He had all this stuff. He was used to having whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted it. And then, yeah, famine came. And it stops. Like nobody will give him anything. People have stopped feeding this addiction. People have stopped feeding this spending frenzy. People have stopped feeding this riotous living. And, and it probably at that moment, he feels like the earth is ending for him. He probably feels like at this point there's no hope. He's probably mad at a lot of people, honestly. 
He's going through some real internal strife. There's tension on the inside of him. He don't understand why he's been cut off. He don't understand why there's a famine in the land. He don't understand where all of his stuff went. But now, as he literally finds himself with the pigs, just trying to find some way to survive, and literally becoming a slave in a foreign land, the Bible says he came to his senses. And it's interesting to me that the Bible does not say that he came to his senses until it, it says that people stopped giving him anything. Something about those two things coming together had a profound effect on him. But now he stands up in the middle of these pigs and he says, If I just went home, it would be better to be a hired servant in my father's house than to be a slave to the world. And many of you are familiar with this passage of text. But what I want you to see is that when he goes home, it is a result of no one coming to get him. And we talked a little bit about this a few weeks ago, that, that, that when, you, when you have rebellion in your heart, it's very difficult to rationalize with someone. And I think when we're trying to seek the lost, many times the thing that sticks out the most to us is the person that has rebellion in their heart because we know that they need it the most. But then when we try to witness to them, we, we ultimately find out that they're maybe just not open to it and they don't seem to be teachable and they, they don't seem to want to respond to it. And then we get discouraged and we stop seeking lost things. And the thing that I would encourage you is, yes, have an open heart and an open mind to anybody that has a rebellious spirit in their life. But the thing you got to know is that as you are beginning to try to seek the lost, don't overlook the fact that there's somebody broken and hurt and wounded that would be more than glad to hear anything you've got to say and would love to be a part of being nurtured back to health through the relationship that you could develop with them. Don't overlook the fact that there may be somebody lost in the house that has forgotten how valuable they are that has forgotten that God has a purpose and a plan for their life and just need to be reminded. But what happens in this son is that ultimately it's a process that unfolds in his life, things that he thought was probably evil, God was actually using for his good. And now when he comes back to the house, the father receives him as though he was never gone. But here's something I want to point out to you. Is that when this boy comes home, His dad starts to celebrate him. His dad puts a robe on him. His dad puts a ring on him. His dad puts shoes on him. His dad kills a fatted calf. The Bible actually says the fatted calf. Almost like it was the most important one that he owned. And now he he, he uses it to celebrate this boy coming home. And now what happens is because there's no appreciation in this house in the other brother's heart for lost things. He gets mad. And he gets upset that that baby brother has come home and now daddy's going to make a feast about it. According to scripture, the older brother actually confronts his dad and says, he has went out and lived an immoral lifestyle, even points out the fact that he's made a lot of mistakes with women, et cetera, et cetera. And he's like, now you're going to celebrate this boy coming home? He says, I've been here the whole time. Where's my fatted calf? Where's my celebration? Where's my party? And the father looks at him and says, my goodness, boy, you're in the house. And that means everything I've got is available to you. No, I don't know who I'm trying to help, but let's go back and see. I, 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 I can't say that I'm very good at math anymore, but I used to be okay at it. Used to, I could take you from the, the Pythagorean theorem to the quadratic formula and back again or something like that. Now I do good to just put two plus two together. But I can figure this out. We got one father... We got how many sons? Two sons. So anytime there's inheritance and you got two sons, what happens? One of them got his half. What's that leave? The uh, Well, y'all, y'all are slow, but you are worth waiting on. It leaves the other half. So what does that mean? It means everything in this house belongs to the boy that stayed there. And he's so caught up in what he thinks he don't have that he don't even know how to enjoy the presence of the father. And part of it is because he don't know how to celebrate the return of lost things. 
Listen, I want to say to you that if you are in the Father's house and you see somebody starting to be restored, you start to see somebody being reconciled to God, you start to see somebody get their position in God back, or you start to see somebody being used a lot again that maybe hasn't been used for a season. Listen, don't you, don't you get to this place where that makes you mad or that makes you cranky or makes you sarcastic or causes you to get over in a corner and run your mouth about somebody, but instead be a part of the celebration because you realize, man, Everything in the house belongs to me because I never left. I'm a part of the Father. And if I will just join in the rejoicing, does that make sense to you? I have seen so many people that don't know how to appreciate the lost being found. You can never... I, We'll, we'll see somebody give their life to Jesus and then go public with their faith through the waters of baptism. And it's, I appreciate your patty cake. But that's life and death we're talking about. You can never take that for granted that somebody escaped hell and gained heaven. We must be about seeking the lost. You know what happened in Luke chapter 15? Is that when they, when they brought that sheep home, the shepherd threw a party and said, everybody, let's rejoice. When that wife found her coin, the Bible says they threw a party and said, let's rejoice. When they saw the son come home. They threw a party and said, let's rejoice. And so when somebody gives their life to, to Jesus, the Bible goes as far as to say that the angels in heaven rejoice. And if you can't find anything else to rejoice about with everything that's going on in our world, our nation, and across the globe today, then let me give you something that can turn your frown upside down. And that is that God is still in the saving business. He is still in the business of taking death and transforming it into life. And if you will set a one-minded mission of I'm going to seek the lost so that Jesus can find them, you might be surprised about the joy that could come back to your life because we are set for an awakening. We are set. The stage is being set for the greatest revival in the history of America. The question is, will we seek the lost? Or will we be found mur... Okay. Corey, please come play music. Because I need it right about now. Is what I'm saying to you truth? Amen. It's the truth. It's the truth. Hey, I bet you if we started surveying people, we'd come up with a whole lot of different ideologies about what this should be and what that should be and how we should do this and how we should do that. And Here's the deal. We're not ever all going to agree. It's just not going to happen because you're too hard-headed. No. <laughs> Joking. Y'all be nice. It's just not going to happen. And the enemy knows it's not going to happen. And so we, we get all confused and we get all divided and we lose the very basics of what we have the opportunity to usher into the earth. To take the kingdom of heaven and make it manifest in the earth. So here's something I learned a long time ago. What we believe may divide us. It may happen. But in whom we believe should unite us. Anybody believe in Jesus? So how about we make it about Jesus? All about Jesus. And always about Jesus. Because everyone needs Jesus. Seek the lost. Seek the the lost. When you're making decisions, when you're trying to navigate things, think, seek the lost. How can I use this to seek the lost? How can I use this to further my relationship with somebody that's lost that needs to be found? Seek the lost. It is a grassroots thing and you are called to it because the Jesus on the inside of you is longing to have your legs your hands, and the mouthpiece of your lips. We are grateful to have you and your family with us today. I want to let you know life-giving ministry is still moving forward here at Three Trees because of people just like you. We are finding needs and meeting them. 
If you would like to worship the Lord with us through giving of tithes and offering today, there are three ways in which you can do that. You can mail your check to P.O. Box 399. That's in Columbia, Kentucky. You can also text the word GIVE to the number on your screen. Or you can visit us at threetrees.com slash give. Your giving is making a difference, not only in people's lives, but in people's eternities. God bless you and thank you for your faithfulness. I want to encourage you, stay connected to God in this season, now more than ever.
Church, we thank you so much for hanging out with us today. We want to encourage you to stay connected with us. And as always, share this content. We want you to stay submitted to Christ during this season. We believe that greater things are yet to come in Jesus' name.